So Ian Dow is joined with us in the LBC studios today. So welcome back, Ian. How have you been? Thank you very much. I can't remember when we last spoke, but it seems a long time ago. <laughs> it it, it <laughs> does. Good to be with you again. Ian's written a new book called Why Can't We All Just Get Along? In it, Ian talks about and asks, why have people become so disrespectful to one another? I'm not sure that it's a, a very modern phenomenon. I think there's always been a certain amount of healthy disrespect sometimes. Mm. I mean, we don't we don't live in a deferential society any longer. Um, we don't have to tug our forelock at us the called elders and betters. And I think the internet has democratised things in, in many ways. Uh, and people have a voice now. But if you give someone a voice, you're also giving bad people a voice too. And there are plenty of bad people on social media who exploit any chance to just be vile and vicious to other people. Uh, And it's, it's got to the stage now, I think particularly on Twitter, where a lot of sensible people are thinking, what, why am I bothering with this anymore? I don't need to take this abuse, but I'm doing what I do. I kind of have to do it because I, I, I need to market all the things that I do to all of the people that follow me. But if I wasn't doing my OBC show and all the rest of it, I, I'm actually not sure I would be on Twitter anymore because of all of that. Oh, fair enough. So your book is part autobiography, part political and part cultural observation. So, And it's also a very enjoyable book to read, really I must is. admit. So Ian, what actually like made you decide to write this book? It, it was several things. I think the, the Brexit referendum um, unleashed a lot of hate from both sides towards the other side. And I had never seen anything like this before uh, in, in my adult life. Um, I remember back in the 1980s, way before you two were born, um, <laughs> the, the, the whole argument about nuclear disarmament was quite, it could get quite testy. But we all recognised that the other side had a point of view. We might not agree with it, uh, but they were entitled to their point of view. They are entitled to express it. And I tried to make an effort to understand that point of view because if you don't try and understand your opponent's point of view how can you possibly argue against them properly yeah but in the brexit referendum i i just think that people lost all perspective and it was as if if you were a remainer you just assumed that all Brexiteers were thick racists. Mm. And if you were a Brexiteer, you assumed that anybody who was a, who maybe had hashtag FBPE, follow back pro Europe on their Twitter handle, was somebody who was a traitor to this country. And it was really that extreme. And you, you I remember a poll, which I think I quote in the book, showing that 37% of Remainers would not want their children to have a relationship with a Brexiteer or marry a Brexiteer. Wow. And it was 11, 11% the other way around, but I mean, that's 11% too much. Yeah. I just thought, what, what have we come to? Uh, mm. I had um, family members, well, I'll tell you, my two sisters, who mm. said, by voting leave, you have destroyed my children's future. Mm. I thought, get over yourself. Absolutely ridiculous. And I yeah. still think it's ridiculous. But the, these views became so entrenched And it was as if we were living on two different planets. Yeah. Uh, And it was partly that. And it was partly, I think, the Queen in in her Christmas message in 2018, she basically said to the country, come on, why can't we all just get along? She didn't use those words, but that was the subtext of what she was saying. Mm. And it was, so it was that, that I think, and the fact that the Mail on Sunday then commissioned me to write an article about that message. I wrote the article and I thought there's so much more I could say on this. So that was really... Um, I suppose the first time I thought about writing in in any meaningful way about it. And Ian, as we know, you've always been a writer, but this book, does it have more power to any other book that you've done? Well, most of the books that I've published or written have actually been edited. So they're sort of collections of essays, which I will have edited. I've only actually done one other book that I've written about the NHS. Mm. Um, But so this has been a very different experience. I mean, I feel like a proper author now, whereas I've always felt a bit of a fraud when I was (laughs) just an editor of a book. Um, And it's been great over the last, what was it now, nearly two months since the book came out, Mm. doing interviews like this on all sorts of different podcasts, TV programmes, radio shows. Um, But of course, it should have come out in May. Yeah. Um, But Uh, the pandemic put pay to that. And the fact that it's come out in August, um, not the ideal time to publish a book. Mm. Most bookshops don't really have many customers. So most of the sales are on Amazon. And I was booked to do 30 or 40 events, literary festivals, panels, 
they've virtually all been cancelled. Um, oh, no. So it's been quite a struggle in a way to get the traction for this book that I think it would have got had it been published in normal times. But the paperback will be out next May, so hopefully we'll have a, have a second bite of the cherry then. Well, I'm very <laughs> excited to get my hands on that. <laughs> so do you think that the level of public discourse and just how people generally like talk to each other has a lot to do with social media? Yes, I do. And as I say, if you if we were having this conversation in 1995 about um, the quality of public discourse, most normal people would have only had one outlet for their views. They could have written a letter to their local newspaper and they might get one published once a year if they were lucky. When the internet came along, first of all with blogs, but then other forms of social media, that immediately gave people a voice. So that was a great thing in, in many ways. And, and it meant that I think politicians could understand the depth of feeling on subjects better. They were probably more in touch because of the instantaneous nature of, of the internet. But of course, it, it has downsides too, where if you send an email to an MP, you kind of want an immediate reply. Um, yeah. It's sort of this, I want it and I want it now society. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's not just materialism here. It's all about communication as well. And if I, if I, if Caleb, if you send me a, a tweet yeah. um, insulting me, it, it escalates <laughs> from there, doesn't it? Yeah. And, and, and you can see how these things happen. So one of the messages from the book, and I know it's, it's a bit bleeding obvious in many ways, is let's just take our time. Yeah. I, I had an incident um, not long ago where um, somebody... Uh, and I should be very careful how I describe this because I don't want to identify anyone. Yeah. <laughs> I was in a situation where someone told me something that they wanted me to do, which I, I couldn't understand the logic of. And my instant reaction was to sort of basically react quite aggressively to it and just refuse to do it. Um, but then I thought, actually, you know, I'm not going to do that. The person then said they wanted to talk to me on the phone the next day. And I said, no, I'll, that was a Friday. And I said, no, let's talk in person on Monday. And of course, by that time, my anger had dissipated. I still yeah. st stuck to my position. So I had a meeting with this person. We had a very constructive meeting. And th there was no bad words exchanged at all. Whereas if I'd spoken to that person the day it happened, I would have been all guns blazing. Yeah. yeah, you don't yeah, want to experience enough. me yeah. when I'm all guns blazing, <laughs> um, and and it's it's sort of just trying to resist the temptation to um, fire back something immediately on social media. I th I think that really does help. So at the end of the book, I've got 50 ways to improve public discourse. Yeah, some of them relating to social media, some just relating to normal life, some relating to the mainstream media, to politics. And I just thought it was important to bring all of these things together uh, in one place. And I've had so many people contact me, people I don't know, who say, well, I, I read those 50 things and I literally sat down and contemplated what I do. And it really made me think. And that's all I can hope to do with a book like this. You just want to try and make people think a little about their mm -hmm. own behaviour. Yeah. yeah, and even with you, Ian, you're you're on LBC pretty much every night, Monday through to Thursday, and you, you speak about your life. Do you think you're an honest presenter compared to other presenters? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who do you, you mean, Caleb? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, Ian. <laughs> um, well, I think I am honest. I, I think yeah. I often wear my heart on my sleeve. If you listen to some of the emotional phone-ins that I do, yeah. Uh, yeah. the d mental health phone-ins as well. Um, I don't hold back. When I first started here, the then boss of LBC said to me, let people into your life. Um, don't hold back. And there was one presenter who I'm thinking of, who I'm not going to name, <laughs> who created a, a completely different character for himself, almost as mm. if he was going on, going on air and acting. Yeah. Well, I don't. I, I keep it real. And OK, there are some things that... I mean, we, look, in all of our lives, there are things that we probably wouldn't want to talk about on air. But I, I have talked about some very, very personal stuff. And I mean, I, I don't make stuff up like that. Um, I, I don't think you have to exaggerate on air to get people to call in. Um, I don't like the idea that people think of talk radio hosts as shock jocks. I'm not a shock jock. Um, 
I can have a good argument with somebody, but I'm yeah. never going yeah, to. Really I'm, I'm never going to go for the lowest common denominator. I mean, the, the easiest thing in this job, Cale, and when you're doing it in 20 years' time, um, all you just need to resist the temptation to just talk about those touchstone issues which you know are going to fill the switchboard within two minutes i mean we all know what we're talking about benefits immigration uh abortion israel uh homosexuality now that's not to say i don't cover those subjects but i don't go immediately in and say well i think we should shut the borders shouldn't we instantly you'll get loads of people phoning in saying yes and i agree with you we should shut the board well that is not an interesting phone in it's very predictable so i liked even after doing it for 10 years and it is literally 10, 10 years this week since I first got a regular show. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, well, absolutely. congratulations. How are you celebrating? <laughs> um, just by still being here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you, 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 you realise that there are ways of engaging with people and ways of, of not engaging with people. I, I, I like to think that I treat people with respect if they ring in. Mm. It's quite something to pick up the phone and, and ring into a radio station for the first time. It's not a thing that you do normally. Every day, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and, and the biggest compliment someone can pay you as a radio host is to say, I'm a first time caller. I lo- and normally they say, and I'm very nervous. Yeah. And it's always difficult to know what to say to that because if you say, oh, don't be nervous, that makes them even more nervous. Yeah. <laughs> I, lo- I, lo- I love the caller who called in and said, I'm a second time caller and I'm not at all nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, well, we recommend that everyone gets the book or listens to the audio book of Why Can't We All Just Get Along. So thank you so much for coming back, Ian. I've really enjoyed interviewing you. But Ian, just before you go, I have one question for you. Imagine you have 10 minutes with Donald Trump. What would you ask him? What would you like to know about him? Oh. Well, I don't have to imagine that, Caelan, because I did interview Donald Trump for 12 minutes once. Okay, tell us more, Ian. (laughs) This was in 2012. Um, He was coming over to London to do a business conference. And they rang me up and said, would I like to interview him? It was at the Excel Centre. And and I interviewed him. He was in Trump Tower and I was in London. And, you know, I had actually forgotten about this interview when the presidential (laughs) election came around in 2016. I completely forgot about it. And it was only afterwards someone said, well, why didn't you play out that interview again? And I said, Mm. what interview? This is, well, the one you did four years ago. And if you, I put put it on my SoundCloud account if you want to have a listen to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love that. Do have a listen because it's me interviewing a perfectly normal person. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, do you think he's changed since the presidency from when you knew him before to what he is now? He's certainly changed since then. I mean, we had a perfectly normal conversation. Mm. Um, it was quite funny. He was... What's he like? What did he say? Well, the one thing I can remember from that is that he, he ended up talking about his golf course in Scotland. And I okay. said, well, that's quite I'd, love to, yeah. I'd love to come and play on it. And he <laughs> said, right, next time I'm over, I'm going to get my people to talk to your people and we'll see. Oh, okay, Ian, that, did that, you go? Really, Needless to say, it never happened. Oh, oh. no, you were joking. <laughs> He built up all this excitement. Uh, uh, it, it, it literally was a perfectly normal conversation. And if that same Donald Trump was president now, mm. um, I, I think we would all look at him in a very different way because yeah. I, mean, I, I cannot imagine how anyone can vote for him. Um, mm. I mean, I'm, I would still self-describe as being on the centre-right, so I ought to be supporting a Republican Party candidate. Yeah. But I can't. I just can't. Um, he... He well, I mean, he he he's somebody that almost makes me lost for words. I remember for the, his inauguration in 2017, I went to Washington to cover it for LBC, and normally when we you, we played out his speech live, it was about five o'clock UK time, and I remember sitting in the studio thinking, what on earth am I going to say? Because I thought once he became president, he would become presidential. Yeah. yeah, but this this speech it was a sort of strutting speech where <laughs> he had the body language of yeah. sort of dictator. And I remember as I came off as I came off the back of his speech, I said into the microphone, "If I was a professional presenter now, I would be recapping all the points Donald Trump made in that speech." Mm-hmm. But I can't do that because that was a speech that Mussolini would have been proud to have made. <laughs> now, not necessarily not necessarily for the content. But just yeah. the body language, if you just mm. compare yeah. 
how he looked compared to how Mussolini looked when he made his speeches. I mean, it was quite striking. Yeah. And that, yeah. that clip was one of those clips that went viral. It wasn't something I planned to do. Yeah. I, I don't like it when presenters just do one of these monologues just to get them to go viral. And mm. I, to, for me, it has to be natural. It has to be something that just comes into my head to do. I, sometimes you get the website team sort of buzz down to the studio and say, oh, can Ian do a monologue at the beginning of the next <laughs> hour? Can Ian do a rant at mm. the beginning of the next hour that we can put on the website? And I, I yeah. can't do that. And I, I just mm. don't want to. So it has to be natural. Yeah. Well, um, so that yeah. that's my Donald Trump story. Oh, I loved it. I loved <laughs> the golf, story. Golf, golf, golf it. You should really put it on your SoundCloud. I'd really yeah, like to hear 100%. it. Yeah, 100%. No, it is. It is. It's on there. That's on there, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Ian. Yeah, thank you very much, Ian. It's and, LBC um, presenter Ian Dale. Yeah, we'll speak to you later. Bye. Thank you.